A very warm welcome to everybody today. Um, I don't know which part of the retreat attracted you to be here, whether it was the suffering part or the idea of suffering being transformed into joy. But one way or the other, we're going to meet suffering in our lives. Um, it's inevitable. And I think most of us, including me anyway, certainly are here because we have experienced some form of suffering which is quite a loaded word perhaps, but suffering can include anything from being slightly disappointed with life or with yourself or with a friend or situation in your life to downright suffering of illness and, you know, losing loved ones, things really not working out the way you expected, divorce, separation, maybe a house purchase falling through, which I'm hoping doesn't happen because uh, as a project, uh, we've just managed to find a suitable monastery after eight years and we're now putting, a, a, well, we've made our offer, had it accepted, and we're waiting for all the contracts. <gasps> so all this inevitable suffering when things go wrong, <laughs> I'm sure we're all familiar. But um, the Buddha's teaching is an extraordinarily positive message. He does say that he teaches only two things, suffering and the end of suffering. But the important point there is the end. And yet he says that it's not possible to find the end without understanding what suffering really means. That means the nature of it, the scope, the breadth, um, and also what to do with that suffering. You know, we're not just um, destined to sit with it and grit our teeth or grin and bear it, as they say in England, stiff upper lip. There's actually something, some meaning to it and something that can be done um, to help us deepen our compassion and our wisdom. And this is why it's such a wonderful message. I um, borrowed the title of the day's talk, uh, the retreat actually, from um, the Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, who was a very famous uh, Vietnamese monk who did a lot of peace activism. He was a refugee from his own country and spent his whole life serving others and teaching the message of peace. And he actually used this beautiful phrase, no mud, no lotus which is really beautiful because that just shows how, you know, in a sense, the deeper we can put our roots down and feel into that suffering, the more we can use it as a kind of fertilizer for everything that's beautiful in the human heart. And I think this is especially uh, possible when we stop personalizing the suffering, the disappointment, the discomfort that we experience and start to see it as something universal, a universal predicament that we share and that we can actually help one another with so it's the core thread of the Buddha's teaching, this idea of suffering and the end of suffering. It's also um, the purpose that people like myself go forth. In the ordination chanting, when we take ordination, we ask our preceptor, please give me the going forth to understand and become free from all suffering. Yeah, I can't remember the Pali. Sabba uh, dukkha nisaranam nibbana sachikaranataya. It means... Um, May I receive the going forth and may I understand all suffering, freedom from suffering, to experience Nibbana. So this is the whole purpose. And in the Buddhist text it says time and again that all beings recoil from pain and desire their own happiness. And many times the path starts just with this simple understanding. All beings, you know, whether we're small, large, human, non-human, even visible or invisible beings, desire happiness. So it's a basic human search, you know, it's a basic human preoccupation really with happiness, with the ending of suffering. And yet often we don't know how to define either happiness or suffering and we're looking for happiness quite often in the wrong place. Ajahn Chah says it's like, a, Ajahn Chah is my teacher's teacher, he's a very famous monk from Thailand who lived in the forest, very um, aesthetic life, life of meditation and hardship in many ways physically. Um, but he was uh, supposed to realize some high teachings in his life and find freedom. So people that were around him said he was very, very happy, had a great sense of humor, quite a wicked sense of humor. <laughs> he lived outside the box, you could say. But he said, uh, often with happiness or, or with suffering, where um, <clears throat> there's an itch on our bum and we scratch our head. So it's like we're kind of looking in the wrong place for the happiness and we're looking to relieve it in the wrong place as well. So, you know, this to me means that often we're trying to fix things up outside. And of course, to some extent, we have to try, right? We have, we're social beings, we live in society. 
there are problems that are collective that it's important to be involved in and not to turn a blind eye to at all because even if it's not affecting us now, it's going to affect us sooner or later. You know, sometimes we can look at suffering as over there with those, that group of people. Here we're okay, it's peaceful. But fortunes can change so really, really very fast. So um, it's important to have that universal perspective on things and to obviously be engaged as much as your capacity allows or as much as your particular interests or skill sets allow. Um, but recognizing that we can only really attend to the cause of suffering within ourselves. And if we neglect that, we become quite um, inefficient in our work externally. You know, we can't really promote peace if we don't understand where peace comes from, how it arises inside. We can't really try to alleviate other people's suffering if we don't really understand the causes for that suffering. You know, we're just amending the superficial uh, aspects of suffering without addressing the cause. So the Buddha went quite deep with this. And um, for me, when I first heard the Buddha's teachings and I heard that, you know, somebody for the first time admitting and saying very directly that suffering is an inevitable part of life, uh, but also activating that wish for us to be free from suffering by saying that there is a path, there is a path out, and that suffering has a meaning. For me, this was just an incredible relief, yeah, because everyone around me had been saying, what's wrong with you? Why are you suffering? You've got nice friends, you're good at school, you know, you're from a stable family and all the rest. But inside myself, there was just this sense of not knowing why I was here, not knowing the meaning of life and also the meaning of suffering and how to respond compassionately to that. And it was only really when I heard the Buddha's teachings that I felt like, oh my goodness, now I understand that suffering can have a purpose and it can activate that wish to find a path. So the Buddha wasn't so... Um, I don't know, sadistic as to say you're bound to suffer for the rest of your life. He actually did the opposite. He said, you know, there is suffering. This is how to look at it, how to regard it. And suffering is to be understood. And by understanding that and um, understanding where our true happiness lies, um, there is a path that you can walk. So whenever people ask me, you know, is Buddhism a philosophy? Is it a, a way of life? Is it a religion? I always say, no, actually, it's a path. It's a path that shows us suffering, it shows us the cause, and it shows us the way out. And if we walk on that path, we can attain complete freedom from suffering. Do you think that's possible? Is it possible? <laughs> I'm glad some of you are nodding. That's wonderful. <laughs> and that's probably because you already have a little bit of experience in, in this process, that you know, when we are able to start turning towards it, we can find some relief. And that can deepen the longer we practice. Sometimes it's hard to see that because the challenges increase. <laughs> I found that in my own life. Like I can look back sort of to my time in the forest in a little cootie with the sunrise and the morning dew and the kangaroos hopping by and think, oh, life was so simple. I was so peaceful and equanimous. And now I have all these big responsibilities because I'm trying to extend my uh, um, blessings really and understanding that I have so far and trying to share that with other people so yes it seems more burdensome there's a lot more responsibility but there's also a lot of joy because I'm able to extend my own concern with awakening to help other people and to build community and sometimes you know it's easy to see my mind is not always balanced I get stressed I get tired but uh, but then I have to recognize that Ten years ago, I wouldn't have had the capacity to be in that situation. So we can't measure our progress by what we feel. Sometimes it's, it's much nicer to measure progress by how much we can serve and how much gratitude, how much meaning we have in our lives. So we're shifting this idea of happiness from being kind of focused on feelings to being more focused on our values and how well we're able to bring those uh, into our daily life. There's a lovely quote, and I don't know who said it, but they said, uh, um, invest in your values, not your feelings. That's just so succinct, but very beautiful. And I think this is also where the path starts to change. Because we want happiness, and obviously we're in this sensual world. We can find a certain amount of happiness through the senses. I don't know, maybe we tried over Christmas. 
<laughs> with Christmas pudding and all kinds of food. Even I had some food at the wrong time, a little bit after noon. Uh, because it was Christmas, I thought, well, I'm on my own today and, you know, I can be a bit relaxed. But af afterwards, you don't feel particularly good about it. <laughs> so it quickly turns the other way. That's kind of happiness going to suffering, isn't it? It's the opposite of what we're trying to do. But the Buddha said there is a gratification in sensual pleasure. And it's not to be avoided, but nor is it to be pursued or cultivated. So he said in instead it should be feared. And feared in the sense that, not that we're kind of going into some guilt trip, but in the sense that it's not really going to lead to lasting happiness. There's this thing that I like called the law of diminishing returns. Have you ever noticed this? I think it's partly why people get addicted to various, I mean, anything really. We don't have to look at only obvious sort of drug addicts or heavy addictions as addictive. What about addictions to social media, addictions to you know, having yet another cup of tea or coffee. Um, and each time you take whatever it is that you're, you know, looking to uh, stimulate yourself with, it has less effect, doesn't it? The first time you have it, it's wonderful, it tastes delicious or it gives you a boost. But the second time, it's not quite as good. So if you're not wise, you actually keep having more and more of it, <laughs> trying to get that initial hit without realizing that actually you're looking in the wrong direction. So these things can be enjoyed but not pursued because they ultimately are unsatisfactory, disappointing, transitory at best. Mm. Even the pleasure of like uh, romance and relationships, they say that for the first, I think it's something like, it's less than three years, I think it's only about one and a half years that you get a kind of hit of dopamine and all these, uh, even serotonin, like quite nice kind of feely, feely chemicals that connect you with your partner. Um, but then if there's not something deeper there, like a really deep and meaningful friendship, often a child, a child coming into the picture helps. Only then does, does these other hormones like um, oxytocin come up. Oxytocin, is that right? Sounds funny. Oxytocin? Yeah. yeah. So from dopamine, from even adrenaline, apparently is one of the initial um, hormones that starts up. You know, you kind of get the fluttering heartbeat. I mean, I don't know, because it's been <laughs> 18 years I've been a nun and celibate for six before then, so I don't know. But still, you can feel that these chemicals are very short-lived. And I mean, I've run on a lot of adrenaline in this project, and at some point my adrenal gl glands just crashed. And I had this, like, a medically diagnosed burnout because you can only go so long even on that kind of um, stimulated, even wholesome happiness that's, uh, that's kind of a little bit excessive, a little bit um, frazzles the mind with these hormones. So, yeah, whatever it is in the world, you know, it has a certain amount of gratification, but the Buddha also said there's a danger to that, especially if we get dependent on it, and that there's an escape. So what kind of happiness should we really be looking for? And how did the Buddha define happiness? And also the kind of happiness that can be born from suffering. So um, I wanted to share with you a very beautiful sutta. I've heard there are a lot of Quaker people here um, today. Is that true? Quite a few Quaker people. I'm hoping that this is uh, sort of interesting too, because I think these laws that the Buddha teaches are very universal. They're sort of natural um, <laughs> phenomena, almost uh, sort of psychological processes that we can observe in ourselves. So even though it's taught by the Buddha, it's not obviously um, limited to anyone who defines themselves as a Buddhist. As I said, for me, Buddhism is actually all about suffering and finding a way out. It's nothing to do with a label that we give ourselves. It's just that I'm in robes now, so it's kind of complicated when people say, oh, you're a Buddhist nun. Oh, no, I'm not a Buddhist, you know, but I just think... <laughs> so I just say, yeah, I'm a Buddhist. Anyway, so this um, particular teaching is from any people into the suttas here or online. Um, it's from the Anguttara Nikaya, the Book of Twelves, and it's number 23. So you can go and check it out later. And it's called the Upanissa Sutta. And I'm actually going to skip half of it and just say very briefly that the first half talks about the origin of suffering from basically beginning with delusion, which in Buddhism means not really understanding things as they are. 
So actually taking reality to be other than it is. And in brief, that's defined as seeing things as permanent when they're actually impermanent. Seeing things that are subject to suffering as happiness. Seeing things that are non-self, they basically don't have any identity or any sort of essence to them as self. And also seeing what's, seeing what's ugly as beautiful. That really means like, it doesn't mean that everything's ugly. It just means things like the body are just body. It's made of blood, flesh, bones, teeth, skin, hair, whatever. That's what we actually see when we look at each other is like bones, <laughs> skin, hair. That's all we see, thank goodness, because otherwise it really would look very ugly. Um, and just sort of glorifying it really, seeing it as something more beautiful than it is. So it's a kind of reality check. And the Buddha is saying, you know, in, in what's called dependent origination, which is the arising of suffering, that it all starts from this delusion as to what reality really is. Not seeing things as they are, but seeing them often as we just wish they would be. But, uh, you know, the reality is kind of in the face sometimes. I think in Western culture less so. But when I first went to India, it was very eye-opening to me and felt very um, sobering in a sense. Because there are these realities of life and death and obviously the suffering of poverty and, uh, you know, just overpopulation, things not running on time, things being a little bit chaotic, was very evident. But also evident was that people would, would live inside of that without denial you know, they would learn to go with the flow. They'd learn to shove into the train and kind of somehow let each other on. And um, they seemed very in touch with the way things were. And also that gave them a perspective on life. And I by no means wish to glorify sort of difficulty in life. But I did find that some white folks who would visit or people from more privileged so-called first world countries would be a little bit condescending. Oh, these poor Indians. You know, they don't have so much. But actually, they were the ones that found the conditions very uncomfortable. They were the ones that would get very angry if the train didn't come on time. And sometimes the Indian friends that I'd be with would just be quite shocked by how much anger these spoiled Westerners would have <laughs> when things didn't go quite to plan. And uh, I could see that they had a sense of something, a deeper meaning, a sense of being connected to something bigger than themselves. And uh, that was where I first came in touch with the path. Anyway, we won't get to the sutta if I keep div uh, digressing. But uh, basically, the Buddha's saying that it's from uh, this lack of understanding the way things are that suffering arises. And that suffering is obviously inevitable. And he's going through um, the whole sequence of that, which then leads into future birth. Whether or not you believe in that, whether you think that's a future physical birth, it is defined in the suttas as physical birth, literally descent into the womb, whether an animal womb or a human womb or whatever. And from there, suffering arises again with birth. <laughs> We're born and it's inevitable that we suffer. So regardless of whether you think that's coming later, we have that now. <laughs> I certainly have a lot of suffering with my gastric condition. I have another friend in Oxford who has um, MS, she's my age, and we were talking about our chronic sicknesses and just how hard it is to navigate sometimes. And yet also, again, how that can be a blessing in the sense that we no longer um, take our health for granted. Yeah. Anyway, so we have the suffering caused by birth. And quite often in the Buddha's teaching, that continues to more suffering. But here in the Upanishad Sutta, it's very interesting because it kind of juxtaposes this dependent arising of suffering with something called dependent liberation. And it's the path out of suffering, which can happen at that point. So this is a juncture which can either lead into more suffering, the suffering that leads to more, or the suffering that leads to the way out of suffering. And here at the point of suffering, the Buddha says that instead of going into all that sorrow and despair and, you know, kind of birth and death and the whole cycle continuing, he says with suffering as a cause, faith or confidence can arise. And confidence here means confidence or inspiration in the Buddha's teachings, in the fact that there can be some meaning found in this suffering. There can be, 
it can be a source of compassion, a source of wisdom. You know, for me, that was very clear, as I said, when I first heard the teachings, it gave me such a high. It carried me through years of practice and serving others and, and giving me such a sense of meaning in my life, ultimately leading me to ordain. And I'll go into this in more detail across the three days, but for now, just to read this out. So from suffering, faith, and then with faith or confidence as approximate cause, gladness can arise. That's pamoja in the Pali. With gladness as approximate cause, rapture can arise, known as piti in the Pali language. With, and this is now in the meditation arena. With piti or rapture as approximate cause, tranquility arises. Tranquility is when we get very still in our practice. Our body starts to settle, our mind starts to quieten. With tranquility as approximate cause, happiness arises. So here you can already see this is a different kind of happiness. Most of what we think of as happiness is stimulation, isn't it? It's uh, excitement. It's uh, something very, a little bit coarse, maybe even just a bobbliness. But this kind of happiness is arising from tranquility. So it's getting a, t a taste for a different kind of joy. Then from happiness, with happiness as approximate cause, samadhi. Samadhi here is translated as concentration, which is in my um, tradition known as bad translation. Actually, the rest of it's wonderful. It's Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation. But, um, but samadhi really means a kind of quietening, a calming, a stilling of the mind, things coming together, everything sort of unifying. Whereas concentration gives this idea of something becoming quite small and uh, narrow and condensed. And I think this is sometimes difficult, and I'll talk about this more as the retreat goes on, but um, this can sometimes lead to a lot of over-efforting on the part of meditators. You know, we think we've got to get our mind still, we've got to focus on the object, don't let it go for any reason, no matter what. You know, you've got to really kind of hold that object in mind, and this leads to a lot of tightness, and actually quite a lot of so-called spiritual ego, you know, I've got to get this and this stage and got to get onto the breath, got to get onto whatever it is. Whereas stilling the mind has a completely different feel, doesn't it? It's much more spacious. It's much more natural. Um, it's something that happens, as we can see here, as the result of a cause. And that cause is happiness, not over effort, not tightness, not stress. So happiness is really at the heart of this and the happiness born of peace. And then it's with that stillness as approximate cause that the knowledge and vision of things as they really are arises. So this is now the opposite of that uh, delusion of avidya. This is now vidya. It's um, seeing things in line with reality. So seeing what's impermanent as impermanent, what's suffering uh, as suffering what doesn't have any inherent self or essence as non-self. And what's ugly is ugly, what's beautiful is beautiful. We're actually starting to define these things correctly in line with the truth, in line with the truth in the sense that it leads to freedom of mind. And then from there, with um, the knowledge and vision of things as they really are, as the proximate cause, revulsion arises, which is a strong translation of the word uh, nibida, but it's a great translation because what it really means is that we, we leave it alone. We turn in a different direction. There's no judgment there. Remember, this is coming from a very still, very quiet and pure mind. But we just leave the things that are suffering aside. It's as simple as, you know, putting down a hot coal. If you pick up a hot coal or say if you get something yucky on your fingers, you don't think, oh, I should just be really peaceful with this, just have a look at how smelly it is, and just don't wash it. You just, you just wash it off. You don't have to have a version. You just, it's natural, isn't it, that you want to drop the hot coal, wash your hand, and, uh, and turn to something more beautiful. So this uh, revulsion is a kind of turning away from the things that don't nourish us, that don't bring peace, and turning toward a path of peace. And of course, this is very natural. Remember, everything here is caused quite naturally by its uh, previous one. And from there, we get this dispassion or fading away. Viraga is the Pali. 
And that just means those things fall away from our mental field. It, perhaps they even fall away in our life. You know, it's like if you're in a relationship that's unwholesome, that's toxic or even abusive. Once you realize that, you don't think, oh, I better preserve that relationship. You try and find a different path, a way out. And when you do, that thing fades away over time. You know, that person leaves your life or you leave theirs. And um, you're no longer caught up with that anymore. So the same thing in the mind. And then with this dispassion or fading away as the proximate cause, liberation arises. And the knowledge of the destruction of defilements. Defilements is a strange word. I actually prefer the Tibetan word, which is the three poisons. It basically means the roots of greed, hate and delusion. Um, I mean, in a sense, they defile the mind in the sense they obscure it from happiness. But it just has quite a, I don't know, judgmental note to it, doesn't it? It sounds a bit, ooh, dirty, we're defiled, you know. It can bring off a bit of a, a guilt complex or shame, which I don't think is very helpful. So, uh, yeah, just seeing this as uh, the uprooting of any tendency, any possibility to, to react any more with greed, hate, or delusion. Yeah, because there's no need to. If you understand how things are, I mean, you've got a choice. You can live in line with them, which is obviously going to happen if you've removed those things, or you can re react and, and fight with reality, and that just makes more suffering, more tension. And then the Buddha ends this little uh, teaching with a beautiful simile. And I think this is a, a lovely simile to bear in mind for our practice. Because this whole practice, the whole path, it's not about your ability. Okay, So don't be here thinking, oh no, I can't meditate, I can't even understand what she's talking about. It doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter. In fact, all of that is just um, the wrong grasp of of uh, phenomena as a self, as belonging to you. You know, nobody has a greater capacity or ability than anybody else. It's all about a process, about a process of cause and effect and just learning to put those causes in place. So the Buddha says, just as when the rain pours down in thick droplets on a mountain top, the water flows down along the slope and fills the cleft, the gullies and the creeks. These being full, fill up the pools or the ponds. These being full, fill up the lakes. These being full, fill up the streams. These being full, fill up the rivers. And these being full, fill up the great ocean. So too, and then he goes through the whole sequence with delusion as the cause, this whole mass of suffering arises, I'm paraphrasing. And then we come to the suffering <laughs> with birth as a cause, suffering with suffering as a cause, confidence or inspiration in the teachings that there is a way out, gladness, rapture, tranquility, happiness, stillness, knowledge and vision of things as they are, fading away, turning away, fading away, liberation and the knowledge of the uprooting of greed, hate and delusion. So I don't know how you feel about that, but... I think that's very beautiful and very positive message. But to finish the talk, we do have to go back to suffering now. <laughs> I'm trying to kind of uh, stage it, you know, between the happiness and the suffering, so it's not all about suffering. But the Buddha did say that talk on suffering is very conducive to the holy life. He said it's, um, it actually leads to peace and to uh, wisdom and to all of these things, to enlightenment, to Nibbana itself. So he did emphasize talking about it. And for me, I actually feel it's quite a relief. I think in my family, we weren't really allowed to talk about uh, difficult emotions at any great depth. It was kind of like, you're not angry, are you? No, 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 I'm not angry. I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> Go to your room if you're angry. I mean, I hope my parents aren't listening because that's just a, it's a parody, really. It's not the whole truth. But this is just our general attitude, I think, as human beings, isn't it? That we don't really want to talk about these things. We don't want to look at them. But for me, I feel much more comfortable facing up to things and uh, finding a way to understand. So how does the process get underway? And first of all, of course, to develop confidence. How do we develop confidence? We need to actually hear these teachings. Uh, if we haven't heard them, then we're not going to have another way out. 
sometimes we can be very judgmental of other people who don't practice or who are lost. You know, you see the things going on in the world, the appalling genocide that's happening in Gaza. I mean, these are extremes, but they're happening to people right this moment, you know, and we can think, how is this possible as a human being, you know? And sometimes you look at people and you think, wow, you know, they've suffered. How, how is it possible that they can inflict the same suffering or worse on others? You know, why can't we learn from this? And, and we can get a little bit judgmental, but how do we know how we would be if we hadn't heard these teachings? You know, maybe we're just incredibly fortunate to be in the right place at the right time and have guidance. Otherwise, we could be just as lost. And quite often, you know, atrocious uh, actions and violence is perpetrated because we're around the wrong people, we're around the wrong ideologies. And my teacher has a lovely phrase. He says, you know, better than uh, criticizing a bad ideology, which can just make us as bitter and, and obnoxious as anyone else, it just present a more beautiful one. So this is what the Buddha is trying to do. You know? and, and we hear this beautiful doctrine and gain inspiration and confidence in that. And for me, I think one of the most beautiful parts of hearing the teachings is that universality of the predicament that we're in, as I said before. Because if it only pertained to us, we might just think, oh, there's something wrong with me. I used to think that. What's wrong with me? People say I shouldn't suffer. There's nothing wrong in my life. But I feel it. I feel this heaviness. I feel this kind of sense of, oh, just being aghast, really, at the, the suffering that I'd hear about even on the news, you know, as a teenager. What are we supposed to do with this? How can anyone hold this? And then understanding that this is a universal thing can really bring up that compassion and that sense also of looking for a universal solution, not a solution that just pertains to me and my life, getting the right job, the right partner and all the rest, because that's just a constant. <laughs> I don't know how many people are still looking for that. <laughs> <laughs> or you have a partner and it's, you know, they're not perfect, believe it or not, because if they were, they probably wouldn't be with you, right? Because <laughs> you're not either. So um, instead of that, you know, we just have this sense of the scope of it and the breadth of suffering um, and start to look at what we can do. So the Buddha said, you know, that um, the whole teaching is contained in what he called the Four Noble Truths. And he used this lovely simile. He said, uh, just as all the footprints of smaller elephants are contained in the elephant's footprint, you know, any smaller elephant's uh, footprint can fit in that. So too, all the teachings are contained in these four noble truths. And the first truth is the truth of suffering. And he said, uh, suffering is to be understood, right? Not suffering is to be wallowed in or to be rejected, but suffering is to be understood. The second one was the truth of the cause of suffering. So he discovered this cause as craving, wanting things to be different, yeah, wanting to push it away or um, not getting what we want, being associated with you know, the people that we don't want to be with um, and, and resenting that, wanting it to be different. So any kind of wanting is the cause of suffering. And he said, that cause has to be abandoned. So I love this because it's practical, right? These things are there, but then there's an action point to take. So it really suits my sort of analytical uh, and uh, Western conditioned mind. And then he said that there's an end of suffering. So this is the big yay. And that end of suffering is to be realized. And for that, of course, he gave a path, which is the last truth. There is a path to the end of suffering, and that path is to be developed. And the beautiful thing was, he said, you know, if it wasn't possible to develop that, if it wasn't possible to develop beautiful, wholesome states of mind, no matter what your situation, he wouldn't teach it. But because it's possible, that means for everybody who has this precious human life, it is possible, if you've heard these teachings, to develop beautiful, wholesome states of mind, to develop the whole path right up to liberation. He actually said the only people that can't become liberated from all suffering and experience this peace, this happiness that's dependable, that's secure, that's stable, the only people that can't do that are people that have killed their parents. Anyone here? <laughs> Taking a gamble? <laughs> or raped a bikini. So that's quite unlikely. And uh, drawn the blood of an arahat. Is that it? I think that's it. So it's unlikely. 
Um, and they're the only people. So all this talk of whether you have enough paramis or enough good karma and all the rest, this is added later to the Buddha's tradition. This is actually more from the commentaries. Um, I think these teachings on causality are much more uh, optimistic and effective than teachings on you've either got it or you've not. You know, it's something that can be cultivated. It's something that's a process. And we can experience uh, the benefit every step of the way. The happiness isn't only the goal, it's also the path, right? And this is showing that from any amount of suffering, it can lead into happiness almost straight away through that confidence in the teachings. So what is suffering? Let's go back to the first noble truth and define it properly, first of all. <laughs> We're circling here. So the Buddha said that uh, suffering basically has all these different elements. There's the physical element, there's the emotional, psychological element, and there's also this existential side of suffering that uh, encompasses simply being alive. So in Pali he said, uh, Jati pidukkha jaranam pidukkham which basically means birth is suffering. Sometimes he says old age and then death. So these are obvious, birth, old age and death. And we can see them in the moment, we can see them as a process. You know, It's not getting easier, is it? Anyone else here with a chronic condition will know. Sometimes people come to me and they say, oh, but you don't have the right treatment. I do have the right treatment. I have the best treatment possible, but... Chronic conditions worsen with age. It's just the way it goes. And then the rest was soka parideva. It means crying, lamentation, despair, sorrow, grief, you name it. I mean, we've experienced it. I'm sure everyone in this room has experienced it at the loss of a loved one or uh, a breakup or, you know, just the loneliness that we've been through as a society through this pandemic, for example. I mean, I, I got quite lonely and I was lucky. I was on my own. But I had a lovely online community that was developed throughout this time. But after about a year and a half of seeing basically nobody except the people just outside my uh, on the street from time to time, um, I started to feel quite lonely and wondered what the meaning of my life was, who I could really share it with. So there are all these kind of psychological, emotional sufferings that we have to face. Um, and then... The most beautiful part of this, well, not quite the most, okay, I'm getting there. Um, the next part is Apiehi Sampa Yogo Dukkho, Piehi Vipa Yogo Dukkho. It basically means association with people that you don't like or love, that there's no um, good relationship with, and uh, being separated from those we do love. Yeah, this is just part and parcel of life, it happens. <laughs> you know, if you're not separated in this life, then you're separated at the end of life. You know, my parents have had a wonderful relationship for about more than 50 years now. They've had a 50th anniversary a couple of years back. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in many ways, they've presented to me the, a very secure and healthy relationship. And I've seen that growing up, but I always had that sense that, oh, isn't there too much dependency there? You know, what happens where one goes? And it does happen sometimes that, you know, even if everything goes well when you're together, at the end of life, one partner dies and the other partner goes very soon afterwards, you know, because they simply don't know. We don't know, right, how to live without that person that's been the central part of our life. And we develop so much of an identity around and in relation to as well. So this is inevitable, no matter how smart and wise we are, you know, we have to be separated from those we love and from those things that we love as well. And it can come suddenly. You know, look at the climate um, crisis throughout the world. In a moment, there could be a landslide, there could be a mudslide, or something could be struck by lightning or a flood. Even uh, in my Chesterfield, actually, on my parents' road, the whole thing was flooded at the bottom. And nobody died, but a couple of pets died in the pet shop, which was really sad because the pet shop got flooded. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we might think we're sort of free from the worst disaster zones in this world, but you just don't know. I'm sure that little guinea pig didn't know it was its last day on Earth. Hopefully it's been reborn. Maybe it's, I don't know, got a better rebirth somewhere else. And then the last part, which is the existential part, is that the Buddha's basically saying these five kandas are suffering. Five kandas are the way he um, described this body and mind. So he was basically trying to um, 
group it into five easy categories so we can understand what's going on. So these five aspects of existence or components of existence are the body, materiality, whatever we, whatever basically belongs to this world, material. And then four aspects which are mental. Um, so that's the feeling part of the mind, that which knows pleasure, pain and anything in between. It's a whole spectrum. Um, the feeling part and then uh, the volition of the mind. So our ability to respond or react. And um, I'm sure I'm missing one here. Feel it, Vedana, san Sanya, perception. So that which perceives, which... Uh, knows which labels and judges yeah so this is a person this is a, a german person or this is a, a camera in front of me this is perception and perception can often be skewed right it can come with a lot of evaluations as well which is related again to this um reactive part of mind the sankara and uh uh and then there's the consciousness itself am i still missing one no that's it Consciousness. But consciousness is often translated as just consciousness, but there are actually six. So there's mind consciousness, ear, eye, nose, tongue, and body consciousness. That's, I think, six. So all operating in their own sphere. So that's just that which knows, but it's a process. Again, it's something that's dependently uh, arisen. And the Buddha said that these five in and of themselves are suffering. Yeah, just to see, just to hear, perceive, feel is suffering. In other words, not to get depressed, but there's something more than that. This is the point. You know, these are okay. These are kind of, they have their gratification, but they change. And because they change, they can't be depended upon, right? So there's something beyond these things that the Buddha is trying to point us towards. And uh, of course, we can learn to use our mind, especially our perception and our um, choices, if you like, in skillful ways to bring about more happiness and less pain. And this is really a large part of what we're doing. It's uh, a training in skillful use of perception, looking at the world, looking at phenomena, looking at ourselves in ways that um, encourages the wholesome states to arise. So as usual, I'm talking too much before getting on to how we actually respond to this suffering in, in, in ways that help rather than create more of it. And um, there are kind of three responses. I think this was um, posited by the Venerable Bhikkhu Bodhi, but I like this uh, categorization very much. He says that the normal responses that we either indulge in our suffering, which sounds very masochistic, doesn't it? But we do, right? I don't know. Does anyone here do that? You know, you're sort of suffering. Oh, poor me, this always happens to me. I remember like 22 and a half years ago in six days that something similar happened. You know, <laughs> it's going to be my destiny forever. Poor me, this is my life. And then we play the sad song and, you know, we sort of look out at a drab view and we're in the mood to suffer. <laughs> Because, yeah, wallowing kind of gives us a sense of identity sometimes. And, uh, you know, it's not to judge it, but just to notice that we do have this tendency um, to actually kind of get a bit sucked in and lose the perspective. And I think this is the beauty of the Buddha's teachings, that he gives us that context and that perspective. It's a universal thing. It's inevitable. But we have a choice whether we wallow or uh, whether we find a wise response if we've heard the teachings. Um, and the next one that we tend to do a lot of is to try and push it away. We don't want to see it. We want to you know, resist it. Uh, we distract ourselves with social media, which makes it worse. I know that because I have to go on there sometimes for you know, promoting what I'm up to and the teaching events. And then it's like, oh, just look at a couple of posts. There might be something inspiring. And then you realize half an hour went by and you feel wrecked. You feel really tired. It's like, I didn't need an extra half an hour online, you know, but we're trying to actually distract ourselves from what's going on inside. Maybe just a, a bit of boredom or something that's not that bad if you look at it. So, uh, yeah, we want to get rid. We want to reject. Sometimes we just avoid it outright. I mean, I've met even meditators who are practicing and I presumed kind of getting to know their emotional world, getting to know their body, how it works, look at how they create suffering inside. 
But then they told me afterwards, no, no, I don't do that at all. I, I just try to avoid it. You know, I meditate because I want to basically escape myself. So we can even use meditation. Certainly we can use meditation in unskillful ways. You know, and a lot of the time this is what's going on, isn't it? We're experiencing a pain and we think, I don't want this pain. I didn't come here to suffer. It should be a bed, not a silly little mat on the floor that's got no decent cushions. <laughs> You know, or emotional pain comes up. Oh, I wanted to come here for peace. I didn't want to relive my past relationship or, you know, the boss at work shouting at me last week. But these things come up because we haven't processed them yet. So we can try and reject them or we can kind of follow the storyline and wallow in it and create more and more suffering for ourselves. Or we can have a wiser response. And that wise response is... Um, to be taken gently, uh, but it does involve a turning towards. It involves going against the stream, as the Buddha said. His path is the opposite direction from the way of the world. It's actually turning towards these things in order to meet them and to understand. So it's not possible, is it, to understand something that we're avoiding or something that we're trying to sugarcoat. We have to actually start to learn how to be with it. And there's this very beautiful way to do it. We don't just go into it with our slightly frazzled mind, but we go hand in hand with what the Buddha called three right intentions, which are beautiful qualities of mind. One of them is uh, called letting go or renunciation. And in this context, to me in meditation, it really is related to that sense of perspective that the Buddha's trying to instill in us, this idea that this is not my suffering, this is just cause and effect, this is nature. You know, it's nature just arising for, for, because of a cause. And it doesn't belong to me. I don't have to identify with it and think this is a problem or this is my fault. You know, this is something I have to um, feel ashamed for. Let me just see if I can look at this with a sense of this is nature. You know, we let go of that sense of ownership, that sense of control in a way, and just allow things to play out. But he didn't say only go to it with that because that sounds a bit aloof, a bit cool. He also said we have to have loving kindness, aviapada, which means non ill will. So there's this myth of mindfulness that it can be such a thing as bear. <laughs> But the fact is, however we're aware is conditioned by our tendencies, our psychological makeup. You know, we might be someone who's a little bit um, controlling or sometimes has more aversion in the mind than a natural sense of love and acceptance uh, because we're not enlightened, right? I certainly have a little bit more of the critical side going on than, than the greed. So for me, the meta is very, very uh, important as a way of looking. And so we actually try to put these things, this sense of loving kindness between ourself and the object. As I said earlier, you know, it's not about just grabbing that object and holding on to it. It's actually noticing that you're in relationship with whatever arises in your mind. There is a relationship there. And in that space between you and whatever arises, whether it's something beautiful or something that you don't really want to see, we can have that lovely sense of friendliness that sense of warmth, even a sense of curiosity and inquiry. Okay, how are you today? You know, okay, sadness, what is it you want to tell me? Yeah, can I just give you some space here? Can I listen to you? Can I be gentle and kind? So we apply these beautiful motivations, these kind of ways of relating. It's a disposition of mind to whatever's right there. And this can help us to meet and also to stay with it for longer so that we can understand what's happening in our mind. And then lastly, and then we'll meditate, uh, we can go in there with an attitude of compassion. The Buddha called that avihimsaka, which means non-cruelty. Yeah. This is also very nice if you consider that cruelty can be a disposition towards phenomena. We can be cruel with ourselves. We can be cruel towards what we're experiencing, I don't want this, this shouldn't be happening, go away, <laughs> you know. Um, cruel to ourselves, thinking that, I don't know, somehow we're to blame or at fault for what's arising in our mind, you know. How many people have those voices inside, those inner tyrannical voices? Yeah, honest people, thank you. Yeah, 
we, we think, oh, you know, you really should be beyond this. You've been a nun now, 18 years, you shouldn't have this voice. But I had a little bit of a, a guilt thing because of uh, silly little things like eating a bit after 12. And I told my teacher, because as Buddhist monastics, we can confess these things. He's like, what would you say to someone else? I'm like, well, I just say, oh, you know, uh, it was Christmas anyway. He's like, yeah, exactly. You know, just look at the causes and just make sure, you know, you're more careful with the causes next time. But yeah, I still felt a bit like, oh, you know, we just got this lovely monastery. And <laughs> I mean, it's really a small thing, right? It's not even unethical as such. But I can still have these voices as well that think, oh, you, you know, you're not doing well enough. You're not, you're not worthy of such a, a great teacher and all this support, you know. And uh, we have to notice these and then see if we can be a little bit more compassionate, a bit more understanding with ourselves and stop judging ourselves so hard, yeah. And stop judging each other so hard as well because we're all in it together and I'm sure on this retreat some of you will have some moments of, you know, tension or distraction or boredom or downright pain, emotional pain, physical pain. And they'll also you'll also have times of quiet and times of peace and feeling engaged with the practice, feeling inspired. So all of us are in it together. So um, with this little overview, it was a longer talk because it's the first of the retreat and I wanted to uh, paint the picture. We shall uh, go into some meditation and uh, in the afternoon we'll get more into the happiness part. So um, if you want to stretch, if you desperately need to pee pee, then please go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> otherwise just have a stretch. So for the people online as well, I think we might go on for about 35 minutes. So we'll go about 10 minutes longer than we... Is that okay? Okay, because the talk was a little longer. So... Making your body as comfortable as you can before we begin the meditation. And whether or not you're used to meditating, see if you can check in with what your body really needs now, rather than sitting in postures you feel you should adopt. If you can, it's helpful. It can be helpful to have a fairly straight spine, but sometimes if you have a back problem or you're feeling tired, it's okay to sit against a wall or the back of a chair, even to lie down, especially for those online. You might have a favorite sofa or even your bed. So just see what your body and your mind need right now. And it can help to gently close your eyes and come in contact with the feelings in the body which give you feedback about the way you've positioned your back, your limbs, your buttocks. My knee is asking for a little bit of loosening up, so I'm going to give it the time and space to show my body I really care. If you're seated on a chair, you might want to check how your knees are feeling. Sometimes you might find that moving your feet slightly forward of the knees can help relieve any pressure. Maybe noticing whether or not your thighs are a little bit clenched, 
tighten up, allowing them to relax, that's outward. And checking your shoulders, another area that we tend to hold a lot of tension, tightening, defense perhaps from one another. Maybe just rolling back your shoulders to loosen them up and allow them just to drop down wherever they're comfortable. Maybe adjusting the position of your arms, your hands. Giving your fingers space. And sensing the space around you. Recognizing we're here together with people we may not know yet, but who share the same intention. The same wish to offer ourselves themselves some space, some peace. The people we're with, the people we can trust that have no bad intention other than to, the only intention is to practice, to develop on the path. And allowing yourself a few deep breaths to help you arrive into your body gently and into this space. Relaxing more fully with each out breath. So if you wish, you could follow me in a simple body scan to help us arrive more fully into this moment. Starting from the top of the head. And to help the process feel natural and easeful. 
Imagining your mindfulness like the light of the sun, shining on the top of your head right now, illuminating any sensations you experience. Maybe clearly, maybe not so clearly. Just letting that be. And along with this mindfulness, the light of the sun is the warmth, the kindness, the friendliness. And you can sense that warmth, that kindness, relaxing. Whatever you experience, letting it be. Establishing that relationship of friendship, of care, of respect. Just soaking up these beautiful golden rays of the sun. Your mindful or kindful awareness. And allowing that to spread, to soak right through your face, your forehead. as though you were perhaps sitting back in a deck chair or a comfy armchair, just receiving these gentle rays of sunshine on your face, opening up any tightness or tension that you have maybe in your brow, Relaxing your eyes, your cheeks, your jaw. And bringing you in touch with whatever sensations you experience. Sensations that are real, that are happening now. Bringing you more and more fully into this present moment. Away from the conceptual part of the mind. And as this kindness and mindfulness, the light and warmth of the sun travels down through the neck and to the shoulders, you start to feel into your shoulders. Just receiving whatever experience manifests there right now and being kind to it, allowing it to be. Soaking up this beautiful sunshine through your arms, your elbows, your 
your lower arms all the way down to your hands, your palms, fingers and fingertips. Allowing your arms to relax. And spreading through your throat, your chest, throughout the whole torso, gently illuminating any sensations you experience from your ribs right across the chest, maybe deep inside as though you're simply soaking up the golden rays of the sun. Imbued with kindness and warmth. That massages, caresses, any part, any feeling in your torso, in your belly, any part that may feel tense or tight, perhaps spending longer there. Suffusing that area with kindness and care. Just allowing it to be. And being so gentle. Moving on. If you start to notice you're reacting or getting tight, just loosening, allowing the awareness to move, to flow. Spreading all across your back, down the spine, And down to your hips. Until your whole torso is suffused with kindfulness. And perhaps you start to pick up more of what's going on. Noticing perhaps many different sensations. Maybe tingling or throbbing. Aching or a pinching sensation. 
whatever it is, treating it with friendship, respect and care, just allowing it to be. And feeling into your buttocks, noticing any sensation in your buttocks, maybe pressure or weight. Maybe warmth. without judgment. And moving down through your thighs. Perhaps deep into the muscles wherever your mindfulness flows. Bringing along with it that kindness, that warmth. Noticing your knees, the back of the knees, giving them some extra care. The knees work so hard. See if you can relax with any sensations that may be more intense, maybe piercing or aching. Just allowing it to be. And being gentle if you find your knees are taking too much strain, you can still adjust them very slowly and mindfully with an attitude of compassion and care. Notice how they respond. And feeling into your legs, your shins, your calves, all the way down to the feet. The heels, the soles, the toes. As though the whole leg area from the hips to the toes were just bathed in golden sunshine. allowing them to deeply relax.
and allowing this awareness to expand to include much of your body, perhaps the whole body. With all its various sensations, imagining your body illuminated now by this beautiful golden sunshine. And perhaps noticing any areas that are still a little tight or tense. What what is needed for them to relax? Perhaps a more spacious, gentle, expansive awareness. A deeper sense of acceptance, friendship. What is your attitude, your disposition to your experience right now? Just noticing without any judgment. Just enjoying the beauty of this one moment at a time. With whatever sensation you experience right now, or perhaps with the breath, if the breath comes to mind. Allowing the breath to be another anchor, a resting place. 
bringing you into the here and now. Just resting with kindness, with whatever comes to mind.
When we're coming to the end of the meditation, just notice how you feel now and why. What was the effect of mindfulness and kindness on your experience? How did kindness help to soothe and relax the body and mind? If there's a little bit more peace in the mind, can you notice the happiness of that? A lessening of suffering, of stress. Or if the mind is distracted, tired or irritated, how are you relating to that? Can you respond compassionately? Recognizing these things have a cause. and extend your friendship to those unwanted emotions as well. Being so kind and gentle with yourself. Allowing yourself to be. To feel welcome just as you are. So I'll ring the bell and at the end of the ring you can gently open your eyes if you wish. I will do a little bit of walking meditation. <coughs> or if you prefer you can carry on. Our schedule is optional. Of course, lunch is not optional because <laughs> no one ever skips their lunch. But the rest is a guideline. So please feel free to, to listen into your body and mind to whatever you most need from time to time. But on the schedule, we have some walking meditation and um, you can have it for as long as you like. It's supposed to be until 12, but You can do it a bit longer if you wish. You have a long lunch break until half past one. So um, would anybody here like to have a little bit of guidance as to how the walking meditation can go? Or are you familiar with walking meditation? Would you like a few words about that? Anyone? Yep. (laughs) Okay, so walking meditation is really just another posture to continue your practice in and it can be very lovely to help maintain the continuity so but also give the mind a little bit more to engage with and um, 
Sometimes that's helpful if you're sleepy or tired. Uh, other times, sleepiness and tiredness, you might just need a rest, you know. So always on the first day of retreat. For me as well, there's a lot of that. Um, so if you wish, you can lie down from time to time. But at other times, it might be just that your mind's a bit distracted or um, not quite engaging yet with the retreat. And the walking can help because there's a lot more to be aware of when we're walking. And uh, so... Generally speaking, we start by choosing a walking path. And here there are a couple of rooms upstairs and also the basement where um, you can choose. You just find a little a spot in the room and you walk along the, um, the shortest direction. Don't walk along the really vert the kind of, is it vertical one? But walk horizontally. Um, and you just have one stretch. So you're walking from one side to the next and then turning around and coming back. And we do it fairly naturally, but at a slower pace than you do outside because there's not a lot of steps. And we just try to establish our mindfulness and kindness. My teacher calls that kindfulness, which is rather genius, I think. Um, kindness and mindfulness together. Uh, in the same way that we did when we were sitting. So just having a friendly attitude towards uh, your experience and also um, feeling into your experience, coming away from the idea of the thing, thinking about your experience, but actually feeling the sensations. So try to put that awareness in the feet and maybe in the legs if you wish. Um, and then we start to walk. So you can see my hands, <laughs> the feet are standing here. Imagine this is the feet. And we just gently lift up one foot and we're aware of the feelings in the foot as it rises and then moves and then comes back to the ground. So you feel into the sensations. It's very easy to feel the weight, the pressure and any sensations in the moving part of the foot. And then we do the same with the other foot. So the idea is that we're trying to arrive in every moment. We're trying to arrive with every step rather than get on to the next step and just uh, really be aware of how it feels to walk. Um, you can see it as just the physical feelings. You can even see it as the intentions to lift the leg and to move it and to place it down. Just see what's involved in that whole process because we do it so subconsciously most of the time, but there's a lot going on. And uh, one tip is to notice from time to time if you're getting a little bit tight because we're walking quite slowly and the mind can get very kind of small in a way and focused in. So just keep relaxing the body from time to time, maybe at the end of the path, just again, re-establish a connection with the whole posture, standing, okay, mindfulness, kindness, and then turning and then walking back. So the whole thing can be quite um, fairly slow compared to your normal walking, but again, try not to make it unnatural. Like if you start to get tight, just relax a little bit or maybe expand the scope of your awareness, the area of your awareness from the foot to include the whole leg, for example. So just adapt it to whatever um, feels good to you. And like with all meditation, there's no um, desired result. So just see if you can enjoy the process. You know, don't think about um, where it's leading and you'll probably find that the mind starts to calm. And this can be a lovely sort of practice in and of itself, especially for people who maybe find it difficult to sit for longer. You can actually do more walking throughout the day. Um, but even otherwise, even if you like sitting, try to include some walking meditation because it's a lovely way to get that continuity in your daily life. Even if you're just walking from here up to having the tea, instead of just like having this image of the tea in your mind and the cue and how you've got to hurry. <laughs> See if you can instead be aware of each step on those stairs. And um, in this way, we can create a really beautiful, peaceful sense of continuity and uh, a lot of care as well for the other retreatants here. So because we're all, um, yeah, we're going to get kind of softer and slower as the time goes by. So we can be uh, considerate of one another in keeping that, uh, that momentum, that continuity and also awareness of the space that we share. So is that okay? Is that enough? Um, yeah, I guess lastly, I just say the end, start and end of the path are really good opportunities to just reset. So you don't have to worry. If you lose your awareness halfway through, never mind. You're going to come to the end of the path. 
re-establish it and go forward. Okay, so you can do that if you wish for however long you like. Um, maybe, what should we do? Should we do a bell or not? Or should we just let people, I think no bell, huh? No bell silence, okay. <laughs> and uh, walk for as long as you like. And then at half past one, which is ages away, we come back here for some more uh, Dhamma reflection and, and guided meditation. Okay. So between now and then you'll be having your lunch. That also can be done meditatively. So enjoy having your lunch. Okay. And have a rest, have a lie down in here if you want. It has to remain silent in here and no food and drink, I think. Maybe water's okay. But you can come in here in that break and just lie down. Okay. So see you soon.